Okay, I'm back. <clears throat> oh, I forgot to witness. It, it was a new person. I can't go into detail, but it was, it was a conversation that was really important about something. And the bad thing is I just so intense the conversation that it just escaped my mind what actually I wanted to go and open the door for in the first place which was to witness I mean I always keep tracks right by the door so I can reach down and give it to postman delivery drivers from ASOS or Amazon just anyone that that comes you know window cleaners that tighten for trade they all get the gospel but uh, my mind just lost it the good thing is this is a person that um i will no doubt see again so that's that's great but back back to, back to this and that that's something else wasn't it in in the anxiety um sorry not the anxiety the um video i did on autism i mean i'll link it in the description below but talking about my mind um just going blank in fact an even better example of that is in the other video called Evangelism and the Most Productive Lunch Break of My Life. Um, in that, you know, I didn't edit it out. I left it in because I think it was a great example. I think it was in that one. It was in, I'll link both of them below, in, uh, but they're definitely, it's definitely in one of those two where you'll see my mind just go blank and I cannot get, I can't recover what I'm trying to think of. Okay, yeah, yeah. Picture this, picture this. I'm doing work experience for a newspaper in High Wycombe called the Bucks Free Press, a big broadsheet. I don't know if it's still going, but back in the 80s, it was a um, very popular newspaper. And I was given the assignment to go into this new as the supermarket that had been recently built and there was going to be a member of parliament or some councillor I think his name was Ray I can't remember his surname he was going to be there for a grand opening okay <laughs> and I'm chosen to go there with my camera and capture this opening event in a supermarket right by all the tills where this entourage of people again the you know the the mp and councillor had these scissors to cut the rib the symbolic ribbon and declare the huge as the supermarket officially open and i i'm there by the tills and they get i'm get trying to get them all all ready and focus my camera. This is a days before autofocus. I'm trying to get my camera settings right. And, you know, I feel that all eyes are on me, the photographer, rather than on the ribbon cutter, the counselor. All, I feel like all eyes are on me. My social anxiety, and I. this is the first time that I can s say um that it was social anxiety and not just i don't know you know what what came before it was an epoch it was something new it was um what came before it was anxiety issues but this was a social phobia situation and i've never had it as bad since I was have my camera on trying to focus and take the picture and direct people and the crowds are there and I get an attack of social anxiety so bad that I start to go my eyes go blind thankfully I've never had it since but I all I can think of was the 
the pressure in my head, the blood in my face, the pressure in my eyes was so overwhelming that my eyes were open, but everything went red, a very dark red. That's truly horrific. However, I, I didn't run. I think I was paralyzed, <laughs> paralyzed to the spot. But I got the picture, the picture was published in the paper. The picture looks great. But it was one of the most traumatic experiences. Just truly, truly mind-bendingly awful. And if it was so bad that if it only happened like that to a person once in their life, it would be enough. You'd never forget it. Um, yeah, not 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 good times. Now I. I referred earlier to Anxiety UK and they've got a forum and a number of years ago I went to a meeting in London. They had some kind of, I don't know if you'll call it a conference, it was a big meeting so it was quite a big hall and you could, you could go up to the front if you wanted in talk about you know your experience or condition and I didn't um, but you know I think I'd like to now if I if I went back I think I um that I could stand up and and talk but back then I couldn't I mean it was it was pretty terrifying for me queuing up to even sign the register um, so if anyone from Anxiety UK is watching this please you know the, the the worst thing you can do for a social anxious one of the worst things you could do for a social anxious person is expect them to be in a queue that's counting down to approach someone to actually give them your name yeah it's very distressing please there must be an alternative way for us to sign in ourselves maybe Now, I don't remember much about the meeting, but I liked it. And I think England were playing some kind of um, big tournament game. And we went across the, so quite a few of us went to the pub opposite, maybe 15 of us went to the pub opposite and watched some football, had a drink together. Now, having said, just said that, the most distressing thing is queuing up and waiting your turn to, to see someone, to tell them your name. That was distressing for me, I remember. And I inadvertently did the, pretty much the same thing while saying goodbye to everyone in the pub. So people are sitting in the pub in different areas and I'm a conscientious person. I want to say goodbye to everyone, you know, shake their hand maybe. So I go round from right to left to these different little alcoves of these socially anxious people to say, you know, it's great meeting you, uh, all, all the best. And I get to this one person to shake his hand and the, the poor guy was had a red face, you know, sweating, obviously distressed. Um, but he was so brave, he held out his hand to, 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 to shake mine and, and, and thank me. And uh, it, the bravery of that chap. Um, but if by chance you're actually, the slim chance you're actually watching this video, I thank you uh, for being brave because seeing you like that, was has been extremely helpful to me to see someone else get in a state 
that I can get in. I want to thank you. You know, and sometimes our distressing moments can be helpful to others, even if it's only someone out there saying, wow, I can identify with what this guy's talking about. And I could identify with how you were feeling. You know, I think I was standing up and you were sitting down and I just coming on to shake your hand. And, you know, I'm so sorry to not be more thoughtful. But I hope if you ever see this that um, I want to say a huge thank you to you for letting me see you uh, with, in your humblest state, you know, all your guard down and the social anxiety visible. Um, because it was, I just had a bond and it, it was, it was just, it, it helped me, it helped me that yeah, here's a guy that's got it so damn bad that he knows how I feel, or may, maybe he didn't realize I had it as bad as him, but I just wanna say thanks and sorry at the same time. And when you've got social anxiety disorder, you are desperate, desperate for help. You're looking to, to buy books on the subjects. You're looking to do all kinds of CBT. I, I, I went through um, hypnotherapy as well. You know. Again, very anti-Christian anti things. Um, didn't know that at the time. So CBT based on Buddhism. Um, hypnotherapy based on, would, no, I've forgotten, it's either New Age or Hindu uh, principles, um, or both. Not good, not good at all. And so I, I, I bought books, I've got this one, I believe that's a well-known one. And I've got, I got that one. Now, I think I got this one before I knew or I was told that I had social anxiety and I just thought my problem was blushing. And this is an important thing. It's to understand it's called social anxiety disorder or social phobia disorder. Phobia mean, meaning you're scared of something, but I'm not scared of people. Please let me know if, if you feel the same as this. It's, it's, am I right in describing social anxiety disorder as not so much as a, a fear of people, but as a fear of ourselves not being able to cope with that social interaction or cope with the idea of someone looking at us, of being observed, that we just go to pieces. Um, so the fear is of ourselves not being strong enough, together enough to be able to cope, to be unselfconscious to an extent where we can function. So the fear is not of, in me personally, the fear is not of, oh, I'm scared it's a person, like, oh, it's a spider or something. It, it's not that. The fear is me, the frustration is me that I'm so broken. Yes, I'm a lot better than I was. And I've kept my job. And, and I've had my present job for 17 years. So, and it's a train driver, you know, I work in densely populated, my train alone can carry 1,500 people. Um, but it, it's, it's strange, something about having that uniform on um, 
back, I don't know if the date's on this, but I, there was one psych, psychiatrist, I said, here's a, here's a paper, um, it hasn't got the, the paper says 2004, copyright 2004, um, so it doesn't precede that, that date, um, but, you know, you've got old system, new system, you know, my old beliefs, how it is, and how I'd like it to be, my new beliefs, and I remember describing to this guy um, that it's strange that when I'm in uniform, I can be confident, or I say confident, you know, it's, it's all relative, but I can look normal in my own eyes, you know. But out of that uniform, I don't feel confident. And I wonder if it's like a policeman putting on a policeman's uniform, you know, it, it gives him some, I don't know, like a, wearing a mask maybe. Uh, this might, it's just coming to my mind. Um, I wonder if the uniform is something about, you put it on and I think I feel that yeah, I'm wearing a uniform. I'm supposed to be here. You know, I'm authorised to be here. Whereas I remember walking down a high street uh, years ago and thinking, not only being distressed and, and the person I was with at the time saying to me, you've gone all red. In fact, in fact, it was so... I, I was so socially an anxious um, or, or so afflicted with social phobia that I was walking down a high street with this person and I wasn't feeling anxious. But this is how bad it was. I wasn't feeling anxious, but this person said to me, your face is all red. Can you imagine? I wasn't even feeling anxious, but my, my face was all red. And of course, the moment I was told that and I was walking in the middle of a high street, a pedestrianised high street, well, you can imagine, you can imagine. So the last thing to say to someone with social anxiety is, oh, you've gone all red, or oh, you're sweating, or are you okay? And it got so bad, my mental health, with this, that I I didn't want to be seen going down this high street too often for the mad mad reason that, and I'm really opening up here, and I don't understand why I would feel this way. The mad reason that I didn't want other people to get bored with seeing my face. <laughs> What's that about? Can someone explain that to me? Because I don't understand it, but at the time, that's how I felt. I didn't want people to get bored with seeing me. <laughs> I'm not talking about social interaction, I'm just talking about walking down the high street. <laughs> So it, this condition can send you crazy. It can send you mad. <clears throat> now, going back to the Bible, and I wasn't a Christian until 2004. Um, I thought I was, but I was uh, what's commonly known as a nominal Christian, where you go to church. If someone asks you if you believe the Bible, yes, I believe every word. Um, if someone had asked me, you know, are you going to heaven? Yeah, of course. Um, little did I know that I was on my way to hell. Uh, little did I know that I was... <laughs> 
not a biblical Christian. Uh, the Jesus touches on it in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 7. Ye must be born again. And that's the crux. And that's a crux question to ask a, a Christian. Are you born again? Now, someone did ask me that um, years ago. Are you born again? And my reply was, I don't understand this born again nonsense. I mean, I've always been a Christian. I went to Sunday school. I've always been a Christian. It's not like suddenly I've become a Christian. And what that was at the time, and no, no doubt even more so now, characters on TV that were described as born again were religious fanatics, crazy people, um, they they were all, the, the anti-Christian bias in the media will play a born again Christian. I think it was an episode on Friends. I think the sitcom Friends, where one of the characters was, you know, you don't want these born again Christians, are you? Um, some sitcom. It's amazing how TV programs the mind. Oh, I should have turned that on. But the Bible has such a wealth of character stories in the Old Testament, especially uh, incredible tales of distress, um, struggle. Uh, against all the odds. Um, I mean, look at the life of Gideon. I wonder if Gideon suffered from social phobia. Um, it, it's, I think when we're introduced to Gideon, um, is it the book of Judges in the Old Testament? I can't remember. I think so. Uh, we're intro introduced to Gideon uh, in his hiding, I think from the Philistines, um, round behind a grinding mill, you know, quietly grinding corn, wheat, and he's a timid person who God chooses to be a great warrior. Now I can imagine Gideon, if he did have social anxiety, thinking of all the people, Lord, you could have chosen. Why, would, why on earth would you choose such a weak vessel? Can't you choose someone like David, a natural warrior, or Caleb, who at 80 years old was as strong as he was at 40 and wanted a, and well, wanted and did run up a mountain and conquer the, the, the Philistines. Um, but the Bible is full of the God choosing deliberately the weakest people, the most broken people, the people that have the filthiest backgrounds, you know, um, the woman at the well, for example, had had multiple, um, I don't think it was husbands, but she'd lived with multiple men, Mary Magdalene, another, you know, people with terrible pasts, um, immoral pasts, and great weakness. Um, and he chooses his people, he takes his people, and he empowers them, and he slowly equips them. Um, and this has been my story, that things got so bad for me, in the year was 2004 and things got so bad, so distressing for me and I can't disclose everything. Because it's too bad to, 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 for this to talk about this, but in 2004 my life was so wretched 
and me and my wife have been trying for a child for seven years and I think we've just forgotten all about it. I mean, seven years is just not happening. And one night at midnight, she turns to me and says, I think I'm pregnant. And it was like, whoa, how can I sleep now? And I wanted this child so badly And for the first time in my life, so I was, I guess I was 36. For the first time in my life, I realised it, it, it was like, what it, it was, it was God. He just opened my eyes to who I really was. And I realised all in that night that, whoa, I've got this child on the way and... And I'm not a good person. I'm wretched and I'm, I'm beyond terrible. And I remember the story of David. He'd had an affair with someone's wife in the Bible. She had become pregnant with David's child. And David's solution was to send the husband into battle and command his troops to withdraw from this guy, Uriah, and leave him to his death. So he'd be overwhelmed by the enemy. Okay, and thus die. Then David could marry Bathsheba and problem solved. Well, God was so angry at David's sin or couldn't overlook the sin of David in Bathsheba that David's son, his, his baby, was, was taken. And this is where we get the, this story is where we get the doctrine from the Bible that um, children that die, whether miscarriage, ab abortion, or, you know, any child under the age of accountability, you know, only God knows what age that is, it's very dependent on the individual. But when they're too young to understand the gospel, to make a decision for Jesus, to, to, to choose life, um, they they will go to heaven and David says in the Bible that he will see his son again in heaven. So that's where that doctrine comes from. And going back to my own testimony. So here I am, midnight. My eyes have been opened that I'm a filthy whore. And I need to repent. I need to say sorry to the Lord and say, please, I, I, I change right now. I'm going to turn my life upside down and, and follow you, Lord. And I made some changes that night. And I said to my, said to my wife, um, we moved to Milton Keynes. It's an area I previously lived in. Uh, we found the best school for this baby, and and I just want to be a great dad. I just want to be a, a an awesome dad. Now the contrast, unless you know my life, you won't realise what a contrast this is. Well, let me give you some some detail. Despite thinking I was a real Christian back. You know, until up to that point, I'd had a number of girlfriends, let's, let's say that. And I used to think that if I ever had a child, wouldn't it be amusing if they found out their dad was uh, a bit of a naughty boy? 
Isn't that ridiculous? How shameful that in some evil way I was proud of my evil lifestyle and having had multiple girlfriends that I that I wouldn't have minded my daughter knowing, you know, that oh dad's a bit of a naughty boy. And I thought, you know, that was almost a good thing. But that that night I was horrified by my past. Absolutely horrified. So it was like a veil had been lifted lifted from my eyes. And my mind was opened by God. Because he'd he granted me the gift of repentance. The Bible talks about the gift of repentance. Where repentance meaning in the Greek metanoia. Where it's not just saying sorry to God. It's actually being so remorseful about your sin. You're going in one direction, you know, sinning, serving Satan. But you you get this gift of repentance where... You repent of your sin, not only say sorry, but you turn around. It's a 180 change, a change of mind, metanoia. And you come back to God. You come back to God. So it's it's far different from just saying sorry or forgive my sin. It's saying yes, forgive my sin. But there's a physical action in it where you reject that life of sin. You turn around and you move towards God. Now after you've done that, then you're on a path of what's known as sanctification where the Lord will slowly um, slowly convict you of certain sins to the point where again your eyes are opened and you th you realise, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm giving it up. That's called sanctification. And we'll never be perfect until we're in heaven. And that stage is called justification. I'm sorry. Rewind. That stage is called glorification. You're glorified in heaven with a, with a, with a new body. Same personality, but all your social anxiety, your autism... All, the, all of that is gone. But you'll have you put the same personality that we can recognise each other in heaven. Justification is when... Justification is the moment that you put your trust in Jesus. You're, you're justified. You're, not, you're no longer um, condemned under the law to hell. You're, you're justified, you're made, made right in the eyes of God because you've accepted his son, Jesus, as, as your righteousness. Jesus talks about putting on, the, the Bible talks about putting on the cloak of Christ. So we're, we're, we're evil and we put on this cloak of Christ. Why? Well, because it's symbolic of when we appear on judgment day, To be judged by God that when he looks at us he doesn't see our sin because our sin ourselves are all covered up by this cloak of Christ we've we've put on Christ like a cloak we live in him live for him and so we're made righteous with God not our own self-righteousness there is none of that but our righteousness is Jesus's It's imputed righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness imputed to us, put on us as a free gift. I've been a research subject, um, as I said previously, but this one was 2008. And it was a study of brain changes during processing of social and other information. And what this was, I was put into 
a CAT scan. Um, so you lie on a bed and you're pushed into this CAT scan or the, the CAT scan thing comes over you. So you, your, your brain's enclosed and I was wearing some special glasses if I remember rightly. Um, or there's a projector you look at, I can't remember which, where it, so you, you've got these, elect, um, yeah, not electrodes, I might have had electrodes, but the, so this is 10 years ago. So the CAT scan's measuring your brain activity. There's a person in another room that's monitoring all this and they're flashing different images up um, to trigger different, or, or to see what responses or what parts of your brain is um, showing activity. And I think there's a central core in your brain called the amygdala, uh, which I understand just goes crazy um, when you're overstimulated. So that was quite an experience. I've also done various um, studies over the phone with people in far away universities studying. Um, I've also filled in countless um, studies, paper studies, you can fill it in, paper studies. Now, this is interesting. I was in such distress that I heard about this operation which sounded like it would be the answer to all my prayers. At the time, 10 years ago, it was five grand, 5,000 UK pounds 10 years ago. So a massive amount of money. Um, and what it was, it they cut the sympathetiotomy gland. I don't know if I'm saying that properly, but it's where we get the word sympathy from, or it's linked to the word sympathy. The sim anyway, they, they, they burn something, cauterize something, it stops not only your face from sweating, but your face from blushing ever again. Who wouldn't want this? It sounds fantastic, doesn't it? £5,000? That's the only downside. Well, I researched it, and the reason I never went for it, despite really seriously thinking about it, is because it's there's a lot of horror stories saying that people have had it and it's non-reversible they've had it and it's changed their personality they've had it and all it's done is taken the sweating away from their face and put it into their groin area so they'd be sitting on a seat and for example and instead of their face sweating from social anxiety their groin are sweats, their trousers are look all wet, or they get up from a chair and the chair will be wet. So it's, it's just transferring the problem. But the, I think if it was just that alone, I, I, I would have gone with it. But changing the personality is a big thing and it's irreversible. And... I'm not saying I've got a good personality, but I was, I, I don't want to change it because I think it would only change in one direction and it wouldn't be for the better. <laughs> it, I think it would take away something and make it worse. And I was worried that if there's any likability about me, no matter how small, I did not want to lose that. So I would advise against this ETS, endoscopic thoracic sympathetic, so let me read this again. Endoscopic thoracic sympathectioctomy or ETS for short. So sure, do your research, but uh, I would really advise against it. So after all these years, countless doctors, what is a summary? What is a summary I can leave you with? 
you may not you may not like it and you may think I'm biased and yeah I'm I'm biased however I I've got to be honest all the books that I read the research I did all these countless studies the cat scan hypnotherapy CBT looking into NLP neuro linguistic programming which again is based on mind bending new age Hindu craziness it didn't work nothing you know it it it, it helped me a little bit but I wouldn't say the therapy helped me as much as just having someone sympathetic you know I had a great sympathetic psychiatrist during my CBT the one that I mentioned I've got on on DVD now I haven't got a DVD player or any means to actually I would have liked to insert some of those clips uh, into this video of me having therapy um, let me know if you'd like to see that and I'll try and find a way to actually get it onto my computer somehow and put it in a follow-up video but it was having that person that even if they didn't fully understand because they didn't have social anxiety they were sympathetic and I wasn't the only person that they'd um, dealt with with this because a lot of them were doing studies they were studying people like me and I truly hope that this video helps you if only you see someone and like like you know see this video and see me and think wow this guy's gone through hell yes I've gone through hell and this is just a tip of the iceberg um, because I've got you know everyday stories for I don't know 30 years <laughs> I mean maybe all my life you know I've had some form of anxiety but uh, it's been a horrid life it's been a really horrid life um, but do not commit suicide that is not the answer it, it, it's not the answer not only are we not not only are we commanded thou shalt not kill but things got better for me and they didn't get better for me until they got so incredibly bad I, I gave you my testimony about the night my wife said that she was pregnant what I forgot to tell you was two weeks previous to that things were so terrible for me I was despairing so badly that I grabbed hold of the um, we, stayed, we were staying in a room before we moved to, to Croydon when my wife told me she was pregnant but two weeks previous we were in this room in Wimbledon that had a double bed and some kind of brass headboard and I grabbed hold of that headboard and I'd shaken it violently in my despair and I'd cried out to the Lord and I and I'm sorry to say this but I swore I swore twice in my distress saying basically Lord give me direction these that's the word I was I, I asked the Lord I, I said I've got no direction please help me give me direction little did I know that it was that night or the following night where my wife conceived now bear in mind this is about 
15 and a half years ago or so, I might be a bit mixed up with the timing, but like it might have been four weeks before when I called out to the Lord, but I, from memory, I think I've been honest with you, it was two weeks, but I'd called out to the Lord for direction and as far as I was aware, I'd heard nothing and I'd forgotten all about it. But the Lord gave me the direction with my daughter and the Lord let her live. You know, he didn't take my baby like David, David's. The Lord let her live. And I couldn't have prayed for better direction. I mean, in seven years in the waiting, seven is a, the number in the Bible of completion. You know, it was like the Lord was waiting yeah, for me to get, exhaust all my own strength, exhaust all of these countless psychiatrists in, in CAT scans, in studies, in CBT, and everything in my own strength, you know, alcohol. Um, I'd, I got, God had got me to a place where I tried everything and nothing was working. And then he answers my prayer, gives me direction of a daughter and suddenly, that very night, okay, I'm changing, I'm repenting, we're moving to Milton Keynes. It's all about my daughter, I'm gonna be a great dad. And I had this direction, so it was, my life was no longer just about me, me, me. Um, I don't, I guess I do mean it selfishly, but you know, it was, I'm in distress, I'm in distress, you know, it's all you can think about. It's this social phobia, you know, from hell um, that makes you focus on yourself so much, you know, it, it's, it overtakes your life, consumes you. But now I have this daughter, someone else to focus on, you know, to nurture, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a natural nurturer. I was born to be a father. I love nurturing. I love taking care of things. I love helping people. And I pray that this video helps you. And the point I'm making is I've tried everything, nothing worked. And if you've tried everything and nothing's worked, please don't commit suicide. Call out on the Lord Jesus and say, give me, please, direction. Please help me. And I think you'll get great comfort in the Old Testament, especially with the characters that have gone through such tribulation and trouble. And they're overcomers. I mean, look at Moses. I've talked before in other videos of Moses. He had a speech impediment. How awful is that? And God chooses him to go to speak to Pharaoh. <laughs> Pharaoh could have killed him immediately. But he, if that wasn't worry enough, Moses has got trouble enough, trouble on top of that, to think about his speech impediment. So these troubles that we've got are nothing new. And we're not alone. We're not alone. And if I can help you in any other way, you know, please reach out to me. Um, this video is so personal that I don't feel at the present time, and I don't know if I ever will feel, that I can actually share it. Um, anywhere other than 
social anxiety channels um, because what I've disclosed to you here are things that my own family don't know. Um, but I want to help you guys. I, you know, I wish there was YouTube back when I could have done with seeing a video like this, just to listen to someone that's talking about things that I, you know, I was going through in you know, supermarkets, in restaurants, in weddings, being like hor horrendous places, church even, to, to be in when you're like this. So if, I, if, if you think this video is helpful to anyone, would you consider sharing it for me? Because I'm not strong enough, you know, or maybe not humble enough to share it in the usual channels that I would with the other ones. The one on autism was hard enough for me. So uh, if you can share it with your friends, please, and, and so it gets seen by as many as possible. Um, because this is a job that's too hard for me. Uh, this is too too personal a project. Uh, thank you all for for listening. And if I've missed out anything, um, I mean this is a huge subject. I'd love I'd love it would greatly encourage me some your feedback, um, some more questions. Would you like me to do a follow up video? Uh, you could ask me things, you know, oh, have you ever had this experience? You know, how did you cope with it? Um, I'm not a particularly good storyteller, but I love hearing stories. I love hearing people's own experience. I mean, I love reading biographies for the same reason. You know, the, life is hard. Life is killer hard. You know, it's just... And then... <laughs> you get social anxiety and autism on top. Man, it, it's, uh, it's overwhelming. But you, we hang in there by the grace of God. We keep going. Someone said to me the other day, you put one foot in front of the other. You know, you don't, don't think about all these mountains ahead of us to climb. You just concentrate on the here and now and you put your left foot in front of your right foot. And you just keep going. You just keep going. Life is so short that um, it won't be long before, if you choose Christ like I did, it won't be long before we get that wonderful glorified body, praise God, where there be no social anxiety, no autism, no ailment of the flesh. We won't, I won't even look old and ugly like this anymore. You know, everyone, are, because age is just a symptom of the fall of man described in the book of Genesis. Uh, this is a sign of us all dying, you know, looking like this. Um, I'm dying, we're all dying. And there is no death in heaven. Jesus conquered death. He came back, rose, rose from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures, conquering death and making a mockery of the devil. And so to look like this in heaven, this is a sign of death, my face, you know, this age. I look young again and we're all look young again. And no more social anxiety, no more awkwardness, no more shyness, no more blushing, no more sweating. But I'll see you in heaven. I pray that I see you all. Bless you.